Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin with the Marcus Hart Valve Center at Piedmont, Atlanta, and I'm glad to have you join us, and I'm especially glad to have my dear friend, Dr. Blaise Carabello. Blaise is the chief and chair of the Department of Cardiology at Beth Israel Mount Sinai, and Blaise, as many of you know, has uh, given us tremendous knowledge about aortic and mitral valve disease, but Blaise, let's talk about aortic valve disease today, because you just recently gave a a great talk on uh, your your ten musings or your ten thoughts about aortic stenosis. But tell me, I wanted to ask you: you've been key in the guidelines. What are the guidelines? The Bible for the management of aortic valve disease? That's exactly what they are not, uh, because the Bible suggests that they're commandments. Right. And one of the most frustrating things for me is that people cite them back chapter and verse, this is what you've got to do. Guideline is a guideline. It means it is an, a, a, uh, an effort to help people. It's a suggestion about what best practice is, recognizing that no guideline can ever be written to encompass all the patients that could you could right. possibly see in your practice. Means that you've got to use clinical judgment and common sense in interpreting the guidelines. They can't fit everybody. So, so they're there to be a road map, but not the specific road that you need to follow. It shows you how to get from point A to B, but you could, you know, you have to have clinical you judgment. You have to have clinical judgment. Very, very, very important. Are you guys going to, and I know you've been integral with both all, with different versions of the guidelines, are you going to be able to, to update these as time goes by? Absolutely. So, you know, the first guideline was written in 98. We right. waited eight years to 2006 and eight years again to 2014. And the field is developing far too rapidly for that kind of delay. So the current idea is that we'll be able to uh, alter them electronically as soon as some major news breaks. Um, for instance, we expect shortly the results of Sir Tavi and Partners 2 uh, trials that look at TAVR in the realm of intermediate rather right. than severe risk. If they are positive um, or even non-inferiority, we'll have to change the guideline to fit with what the data say and then help people um, in their practice according to that. That should be able to be done electronically, not convening the whole group and rewriting the thing from scratch. Great, that, that'll be super. So, boys, a, a, our knowledge of aortic stenosis and our, so obviously our therapies have changed dramatically, but our knowledge of aortic stenosis has changed, uh, I think, also dramatically since you and I began our training. What, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about AS? What have we learned over our lifetime? Well, I think maybe one of the more important things we've learned is that the aortic valve and aortic stenosis is not just a hunk of calcium that represents scar tissue from wear and tear. Um, the aortic valve and aortic stenosis is an active inflammatory organ um, with thermal heterogeneity. That is to say there are parts of the valve um, that are physically hotter than other parts. Those are areas that have intense lymphocyte concentrations and that because it's an active inflammatory process in some way uh, akin to that of, of coronary artery disease, right. there, there's a good chance that we might be able to treat it. We might be able to retard its progression once we understood what the targets were and once we understood what the various therapies might be. So this is an ongoing inflammatory process. Yeah, it absolutely is. And does it you know, there's been a lot of hope that, so if it's an, if it's an atherogenic type process, can we treat it with statins? Well, so there is, and, and there are now um, two major trials um, that looked at that uh, in varying degrees of severity and both came up bust. Right. There was no evidence that the statins, even though they reduced total cardiovascular events, by reducing coronary events, right. as you would expect, yeah, yeah. as sort of a reality check, they did not retard the progression of the disease, and we are beginning to get some insight. It appears that statins are procalcific. So by calcifying the coronary plaque, stabilizing it and preventing it from rupturing, it would reduce events. 
that same process, if it happened in the plaque of aortic stenosis, would make the valve stiffer uh, and, and more likely to be stenotic. But you're not saying we shouldn't use statins in these patients? Most of these patients should yeah, have a statin. Right. If you look at the guidelines for statins, first of all, the average age of AS is now about 75, almost automatically puts the patient on a statin right. no matter what. And uh, they're perfectly important, they're very important drugs that should be used accordingly not with any uh, indication one way or the other for aortic stenosis. We can talk all the time about statins and this thing, but, but other things you mentioned to me, which I heard you talk about, which is really important, is just the presence of hypertension in the population and what that does to our measurement of aortic sure. stenosis. Sure, our, our patients are getting older, uh, and the average patient now with AS is 75, and the average age in the TAVR trials is 80 population develops high blood pressure as they get older, and so we've got to be cognizant of that and treat it. High blood pressure at the time of an echocardiogram uh, may blunt outflow across the valve and reduce the gradient. Right. Uh, you might misdiagnose the patient as not having severe disease if they happen to come into the echo lab, uh, see the, the pretty sonographer and their pressure is <laughs> 200, you know, they, they may, you may make the wrong diagnosis. Likewise, if we just say, well, you know, we fixed the guy's valve, that's all we need to worry about, and post-operative or post-TAFR, the patient now has still a blood pressure of 180. First, they'll have all the negative consequences of having high blood pressure. They won't realize any of the benefit of fixing their aortic valve because the load on the ventricle hasn't changed sure, very yeah, much. Still the same. The, Blaze, the, the, um, you, know, you, you were the author of the, the numbers game in aortic stenosis, the valve area of one, the four meters, you and Catherine, and some other things. But isn't, isn't aortic stenosis more also about or more about what the effect of that load is on the ventricle. In other words, the, the myocardium, and I'm, I'm making reference to gadolinium imaging and strain imaging of LV function and all that. A absolutely, the, the, what, the, what those numbers were an intent to do were to say, if your patient has the typical symptoms of dyspnea, um, a syncope, or angina, how could you be relatively sure that it was due to aortic stenosis? And so we defined those numbers as saying, yeah, if the patient has symptoms and they got these numbers, they probably have symptomatic aortic stenosis. Right. But those numbers don't tell you what's happening inside the myocardium. Um, they simply reflect that the, there's a load there. Now we have to understand, just as you say, what is that doing to the ventricle? Could it be that that load is identical from person to person and has exactly the same effects? It's impossible. So that the individual patient's response to those loads is gonna teach us about when to intervene more than those numbers have. And how do we, how do we judge that? Is, that, is it, is it um, you know, things like gadolinium imaging? Is it things like strain? Is it biomarkers? How do we well, judge the effect of that load on the ventricle? I'm not trying to be a wise guy. We're both old and we start, <laughs> okay, with, a good, we start with a good history and physical and that's the first, you know, okay. you know that's, the, that's the beginning. That's only the beginning. Um, I think from there we, we look at ventricular motion and, and certainly that can be um, um, more um, succinct by looking at global strain. But then what's in the myocardium? Is there fibrosis developing? Fibrosis is never good and it's it doesn't bad. go away. You know, you fix the other, the actin and myosin remodel, the fibrosis doesn't. Uh, and so the gadolinium scanning uh, MRI will be very helpful, I think. And then there've got to be biomarkers that tell us that that's happening. And it might be as simple as some blood tests that say, look, this is trouble. Um, you need to be aware, Mr. Clinician or Mrs. Clinician, that, that um, that, that, that this patient is about to get in trouble, even though the echo still looks pretty good. Right, uh, valid, valid point. So you and I would have never, I, th I think, you know, can you imagine in 1978 or, you know, if somebody said, we're not gonna need to operate on that patient, we're gonna put a little valve on the end of a catheter and stick it <laughs> yeah, in there, right, they're gonna yeah, go. Yeah, sure, yeah. Like, yeah, what were you drinking? <laughs> or give me some. But um, as, you, as you stand today and you look forward, um, are we gonna are we gonna do TAVRs on the majority of aortic stenosis patients in the future? The intermediate risk, low risk. I, I think you know it's quite possible. One of our the speakers later on in the session, Michael Mack, it can be quoted as saying the tie goes to the runner. 
That is to say, if you have two procedures, one's open heart surgery, the other's a TAVR, and they have even equal effects, the patients are, of course, going to want to, the, the less invasive tool to fix the same problem. And, and, and we're just at the beginning of this. Um, these valves are going to, you know, one of the curses of TAVR is post-procedure paravalvular leak. The engineers are already designing uh, valves that don't have and strokes. And strokes, strokes have come way down. Pacemakers and, yeah, still is there, but they've come down. They've come down, and we'll, so so this is going to get better and better. Now we've got to be fair. Um, our surgical colleagues have invented safer and better operations. From the time you were fellows, the operative risk has plummeted. Right, absolutely. Um, but it can only get so low, and they can only do so much, and they still have to do an operation. Do you, do you, do you, would you predict, though, that the majority of aortic valves, say, in the next, uh, let's if, if we look down 10 years from now, is the majority of aortic valve procedure is going to be done transcatheter? I would say the majority of simple aortic valve procedures will be done transcatheter. That is to say, if the patient also has concomitant mitral regurgitation, tricuspid disease, or thing, aortic or, root problems, or aortic or things, root yeah. problems and coronary disease, things that can be addressed in the operating room uh, as fastly or even more fastly than we can do percutaneously, that changes the equation. And certainly, um, and one thing we've learned is that fixing the aortic valve tells you very little about what's going to happen to the mitral. And we, oh, well, they fix the aortic valve, the gradient will go down, the mitral regurgitation will get better, and eh, it doesn't always happen. And so I think that, that in all things being equal, that patient is probably better off with surgery where the surgeon can at least put a ring on the mitral and repair the, you know, replace the aortic at the same time. I mean, it, you know, when I think, again, we're sounding like old, old men sitting around talking, but when you think about the the tr tremendous advances that have occurred in diagnosis of aortic stenosis and now therapies of aortic stenosis, it's really pretty draconian, I think, don't you? Oh, uh, you mean what, what we used to do? What yeah. we used to what do. We used what to we did do. back in my Well, and I, I'm surely our, our oncology friends were going to say, you used to give them what? <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. You know. Uh, so yeah, surely, and that, but is, what an exciting time to be a cardiologist, both for us to look at the advances that occurred and, and for our trainees, the only could only guess at the advances that will occur. And I think this knowledge has clearly benefited the patients. Oh, goodness a, gracious. That's a tremendous thing. Well, listen, you've made, um, you've made tre great contributions to our knowledge and, and continue to do that. And that I deeply appreciate, I appreciate that as well as I do your friendship. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Randy.